much, Amy. Appreciate you doing that. Uh, as I mentioned uh, last week, this week is uh, on the 27th of May, begins National Reconciliation Week. And I encourage you, if you have an opportunity to visit um, by internet commongrace.org.au, uh, commongrace.org.au and on, uh, on that website, you'll find devotions and encouragement as we consider what it means to walk together with our First Nations people. Uh, and so we'll have a little bit more to say about, uh, about uh, National Reconciliation Week again next week as well. Uh, today, we continue our message series uh, on demonstrating compassion. It's the third of our values as Northern community. One of them is deepening spirituality, developing community and demonstrating compassion. And it's been great to hear Sam over the last few months. Uh, and to hear her uh, connect with us uh, through the time when uh, we have her preach. And still, I thought it'd be nice to hear from Greg today. And it just so happens that the questions asked fit in with the message for today, almost as if it was planned. Who would have thought it? Well, uh, I'd invite uh, Greg, if we can uh, have Greg uh, unmuted as well. And I just wanted to ask Greg a couple of questions. Um, Greg, who or what got you into gardening? It was my gran. I was allowed to eat as much as I wanted as long as it came from the garden. So it didn't spoil my dinner and it wasn't after lunch or before certain meals. So it got me outside and got me playing with bugs and getting dirty, which I love to do. So. It was yep. a lot of fun. So okay. I give all the credit to my gran. Okay. So were there particular things in gran's garden that you really like to eat? Like anything special that you'd hunt out first? I could always remember the um, purple beans. They were placed up against, against the trestle and that was the first thing that you got to in the garden. So okay. after that was always the carrots. Okay. <laughs> Love the Bloody beans and the carrots and ripping them up, eating yep. them. And it's that whole process of discovery. Oh, look, there it is. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so what do you like about gardening? That I don't have control over it. As much as I can plant and fertilise and feed, what I do is very insignificant to the garden. I look at it more than I do anything. And that's all I can do, really. I have to let Mother Nature and God take its course with the garden. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um What's your favourite thing to grow in the garden? It would have to be sorrel, which is a extremely sour lettuce, but it's not bitter at all. It has a very lemony taste to it. Um, fell in love with it when I did my first job and I've been growing it ever since. I've grown it in three different states now, New South Wales, ACT, and now Melbourne. And it's just okay. one of those plants that I always plant the first thing I do when I move into a new place. Yep. Okay. And so comparing, because it's a bit early for um, comparisons between uh, uh, Melbourne and ACT and New South Wales, but how did you go ACT and New South Wales as far as sorrel? Did it grow better in one place than the other? Not really, no. Because I think it might be a weed because it just <laughs> loves to grow. And <laughs> yep. I give it to friends and family and that all seemed to grow it too. So okay. it was just a hardy vegetable that was... Fantastic to grow. <laughs> yep. And because I, I know that you have a, a particular uh, preference for growing things that you can eat and, and enjoying that. Uh, what do you like about eating what you've grown? It tastes different to what you buy. And whether it's a mindful thing that I grew this, I produced this, therefore it tastes better, or it's just the satisfaction. If I did spend so much time looking at this and taking care of it, removing the grubs and de-weeding it, it, yeah, it must be a satisfaction thing. And quite often, I don't eat it myself. I have friends and family around and get to share what I have grown with them. So, community yep. thing as well. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's nice to be able to share some of the produce and, and that you put a lot of effort and work into to be yeah. able to grow that and then to give it out to other people as well. 
And it also means that when you've got that massive harvest of all the things popping up and fruiting all at once, you can do something with it. Exactly. Make up little care packages to hand out to people. I like yeah. it. Brilliant. Oh, great. Well, great to hear some uh, thoughts from you about uh, your, your love of gardening. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of other people um, at, at Northern that would be able to identify with uh, a lot of the stuff that you've talked about. I don't know about the sorrel, but maybe they've got their own <laughs> particular preferences of, of what they love to uh, grow as well. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Greg. Um, I wonder if we have ever considered that when we garden, we are actually practicing theology. When we build a house, we practice theology. When we buy things at the supermarket, we're actually practicing theology. Theology is the study of God and what we learn of God hopefully uh, transforms uh, into blessed action. As the writer in James 1, to 25 says, um, when he's writing about reflecting on uh, applying what we've learned. Um, don't just listen to God's word. You must also do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at a, your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Avid gardeners will tell you that you can almost listen to the garden and it will speak to you. You can see the signs of what it's telling you and what it needs. And it should actually come as no surprise that the Bible actually supports this idea. In the Old Testament, in Job chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, it says this, just ask the animals and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the sky and they will tell you. Speak to the earth and it will instruct you. Let the fish in the sea speak to you. In fact, listening to and looking at creation can speak to us about God as well. Paul writes in Romans 1 verse 20, For ever since the world was created, People have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his, uh, his eternal power and divine nature, so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. Earlier, Amy read from Romans chapter 8, and it's worthwhile recalling what Paul writes in verses 20 and 22. In Romans 8, 20 through to 22, it says this, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we, all, uh, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. But you see, there's a problem. Unfortunately, as Christians, we have not practiced good theology. Rather than being good stewards of God's creation, we've exploited God's creation for short term benefits. If we listen to creation, we can actually hear it groaning. And unfortunately, we've added to the groans of pain creation cries out with. Rather than working with God for the redemption of creation and demonstrating compassion to the world God created, we've actually worked often against God. Let's consider just one area of concern, and that's the area of plastic. In a recent documentary shown on N NBS, uh, sorry, NBS, SBS, Drowning in Plastic, Wildlife biologist Liz Bonin worked with some of the world's leading marine biologists and campaigners to discover the true dangers of plastic in our ocean. In the documentary, Liz went to a city in Indonesia where actually a friend of mine now lives. And she showed us the impact of Unilever's packaging. Now you might not know Unilever yourself, but Unilever uh, making brands such as Bushels, Lipton, Lux, 
Omo, Jif, Streets Ice Creams and Ponds, just to name a few. And while in Australia, we buy their products in large containers, in Indonesia, Unilever sells millions of single sachet products. And we've got a slide that shows some of those products that are shown in. So my friend, um, he actually went through a shopping center and he um, pulled out um, his uh, phone and took some photos for me on Friday. And, and as he did, there was a typical shopper in the store with around 200 of these single sachets in their shopping trolley. Most of the, the sachets are sold through local mum and dad warungs or shops. And these sachets get thrown out with many of them ending up in their rivers and then into our oceans where the fish we eat and the birds we are in awe of swim and feed. Unfortunately, our practice of theology has turned a blind eye often to issues such as this. We can wave our finger and ignore the complexities of the needs of these products and that they seek to resolve people in Indonesia literally living day to day. The need for income generation for mum and dad stores, limited space in homes, and the convenience of shopping locally. Even if you don't believe Genesis 1 and 2 is literal, but more a poetic form, or you sit well with evolution or are a theistic evolutionist, regardless of what your view is there, there is a significant value that is sometimes missed in Genesis 1 and 2. A value which is at the very heart, has a concern for the world in which we live. In Genesis 1, we read the following, starting at verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. Then they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it reign over the fish in the seas, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals and the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And the evening passed and the morning came, marking the sixth day. For some reason, we've mistakenly thought that as we are the pinnacle of God's creation, mankind or humankind, when God gave us creation to rule over and subdue it, that we um, would not have to give it back to the same God who lovingly created it. Somehow we thought, oh, well, he's given it to us. We can do with it what we like, and we don't actually have to return it. We somehow thought that it was ours to do with as we choose, without having to give an account for our actions. Wenham, who wrote his commentary on Genesis, has this to say. Humans rule the world on God's behalf. This is, of course, no license for unbridled exploitation or subjugation of nature. Ancient Oriental kings were expected to be devoted to the welfare of their subjects, especially the poorest and weakest members of society. By upholding divine principles of law and justice, rulers promoted peace and prosperity for all their subjects. Similarly, Mankind here commissioned to rule nature as a benevolent king, acting as God's representative over them, and therefore treating them in the same way as God who created them. Thus, animals, 
through, though subject to man, are viewed as his companions in Genesis 2, 18 to 20. Genesis 2 puts it beautifully when we read in Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. For me, this watching over is a stewardship action. We don't own creation. When God gave us, God gave creation to us, the creator never relinquished ownership, but instead entrusted the world to us to tend and watch over. In Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, we read this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the earth's, the ocean's depths. When Jesus comes again and when we stand before him, we return the world Jesus created back to its rightful owner. And I wonder, what condition will it be in? As I saw this documentary of the photos um, and the photos of my friend, I was appalled as I sat there sipping my tea that was packed in a single serve plastic sachet. And I was confronted by my own arrogant hypocrisy and the need that I have for personal change. A great organisation called Tear encourages with a video that hopefully we'll be able to show you now. Plastic, it's everywhere. And so much of the plastic we consume, we use just once. Sure, plastic has made our lives faster, cheaper and more convenient, but at what cost? Globally, plastic pollution is reaching a crisis point. It's contaminating our food, affecting the air we breathe, getting into our waterways and filling up our oceans. Fueled by our immense appetite for more, the mountains of plastic waste are growing and the world's poorest people are being hit the hardest. In developing countries, someone dies from diseases related to mismanaged waste every 30 seconds. But it doesn't have to be this way. As Christians, we need to put our faith into action to move these mountains of rubbish. By speaking up and holding to account the big multinationals who produce so much plastic. By living differently, consuming more mindfully and not supporting businesses that hurt people and our planet. When we offer up our everyday, ordinary lives to God, extraordinary things become possible. Find out more and get involved at tier.org.au slash rubbish. Thanks so much for showing that. You see, none of us are exempt. Each one of us is called by God to tend, to tenderly watch over creation as stewards who will one day return this world to its creator. And at that time, we'll have to give an account of how we have made it better because of our good practicing of theology. For me, uh, I'm no longer going to buy fresh single serve tea bags um, that are packaged in plastic. For Mary and me, we're going to make a concerted effort to reduce our use of single plastic packaging. Even when recycled um, into lower grade plastic products, those plastics um, eventually make their way into landfill or waterways. Others in Indonesia are trying to solve the problem as we're about to see in this excerpt from the Drowning in Plastic documentary that I thought you might be interested in. Many of us are looking for ways of becoming more environmentally conscious, but seaweed might not be the first thing that springs to mind. But an Indonesian inventor has found new ways to use the marine algae. Liz Bonin went to see how. What is this made of? It's made of seaweed without using any chemical process. So we can use it from the, like from the bar and then from the coffee sachet, stir it. That's a great cup of coffee.
for soap, so you don't need to open the soap. We can just wash our hand. That dissolves really quickly. I presume the only nutrition in, in this is in the wrapper. While there are still some concerns about how seaweed farms might affect coastal ecosystems, the potential of this design is enormous. It seems to me to be such an exciting, but more importantly, a really concrete solution to the plastic problem. And it's coming from a young Indonesian. He's only 25 years old. It's coming from a country that's one of the biggest plastic polluters in the world. I cannot wait to see what this guy achieves in the next few years. Yeah, it's really exciting to see how, um, whilst in Indonesia they recognise that they've got a massive problem, they're also trying to be so creative in finding a really good solution. At Northern, we've been on a journey for the last few years to demonstrate compassion to the world that we steward. Now, we're not always going to get it right, but we're trying to practise better theology. In March, way back in March 2019, we made a significant change to our waste management system. We actually entered into an agreement with Waste Ninja, who provide a, a commercial composting facility for us. And we talked to Darabin Council about it. And a couple of months later, in May 2019, Darabin Council actually arranged for a tour of their composting facilities. Last year, we changed all but our auditorium stage lights to LEDs to try and reduce our energy consumption. Two months ago, we changed to compostable bags for our packaging of bread. Now this comes at a cost, it's actually 180% more expensive for us to do this. For every loaf of bread we give, it actually costs us six cents. Now that may not sound like too much, but in the last two months, we have bagged up almost 4,000 packets of bread to give to the community for free. Thanks to all those people at Northern that have been involved in collecting it over the last few years, but especially in more recent months as well. For the last 12 months, we've been keeping an, out, an eye, for, our eye out for some responsible takeaway containers. And in the next two weeks, we're gonna be moving away from plastic packaged uh, takeaway containers to sugarcane based takeaway containers. And once again, this has a 48% increase in cost to us, it's 33 cents each. So, but the great thing is instead of us um, using 500 single use plastic containers, uh, which are being thrown away every month, we now will be moving to food packaging from containers made from sugar cane. And these containers can be frozen, microwaved, and even heated in the oven. In three weeks, we will have installed a 30 kilowatt sol set of solar panels on the roof to help reduce our energy consumption. And I invite you to in join with me in praying that we're gonna be able to get another small grant to install more. We've also just invited Yarra Valley Water to come and help us save on our water usage in the future. You see, at Northern, we believe that serving the community should not come at the cost of God's creation. Sharing the gospel should not interfere with creation's own voice of declaring its creator. Remember what we read earlier in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. It's easy to think that our practice of theology is for pastors or Bible college lecturers. But each one of us is called to practice theology and to bear witness to the gospel and not have it hidden behind the waste of convenience. Because each time we do, creation groans a little more. So how might we respond today?
Well, there's a couple of things that I want you to, I want to encourage you to consider. What might you be able to do prayerfully? What might you be able to prayerfully do to demonstrate compassion to the world that you also have a part to play in stewarding? What's a new practice that you could commit to in this space? How might you bear witness to others about your decision to honour God in this way? It's not about bragging. It's not about saying, how good am I that I'm so much better than anyone else? But to give an explanation when we ask, when we're asked by others about why we make the choices that we do, that it's not just that we want to do it because it's good for the environment, but because we believe that God created what we've been gifted and that we are good stewards, wanting to be good stewards of that. And I guess it's easy to have these thoughts, but I wonder whether you're prepared to actually be accountable to someone about it. To whom will you be accountable to for making this commitment? So there's going to be some music played in just a moment, but I encourage you to prayerfully consider how God might be wanting you to respond today to what you believe God is saying to you. Thanks. <laughs> 